Hey everyone, I'm here to review Thomas Aquinas 101 by Bishop Robert Barron. It's very interesting. I'll I'll get to the technical note in a little bit, but I want to talk to you a little bit about my background first. So in my undergraduate studies, my major was political science, and the focus within that was international relations. So of course, we are studying American politics, but I also focused on foreign policy of the American regime and, and things that other people would do on an international, kind of an internationalist perspective of the world that's not so narrowly focused on the United States as well. But of course, American history is what kind of got me interested, and of course, the political history the history of the, the regime changes here and abroad are what drew me into those studies. But my minor was in philosophy. And minor is a misnomer because I missed one class. So I missed one class, which would have been, um, I forget what they call it, but it's basically the last class that you take in which you do a large paper focused on one subject. Other than that, you know, a normal minor is four classes. I believe I took seven, seven or eight philosophical courses. So I basically majored in it. And the reason I, I skipped getting the double major is because I got the opportunity to work for Congressman Dennis J. Kucinich in the House of Representatives as his legislative intern from September 2011 to December 2011. And actually during that time period, if you look at some of the speeches that he gave, you might see the kind of fingerprints of your boy behind it. I remember doing certain kind of um, obituaries of citizens from Ohio because that's where he was a representative, although we were in D the DC office, not in his Ohio office. Anyway, it's, it's an aside. Philosophy was something that was a major study of mine. Pepperdine being a Church of Christ, a Protestant denomination, it has this Western rationalistic, scholastic approach to things. And it was satisfying my kind of intellectual curiosity at the time because I was able to pres uh, pursue kind of questions about good and evil, uh, which are ethics, questions about knowledge itself, which is epistemology, and questions about metaphysics from a Christian perspective, which I likely would not have gotten had I gone to a more secular university. So I got to kind of pursue both secularistic, atheistic, fatalistic, I mean, so many different avenues of philosophical conversations and pursuits. And, and some of them frustrated me in the end. But I think overall, it helped expand my brain, especially learning Aristotelian logic. I think almost anyone would benefit from that. One of my philosophy professors, actually my logic professor, and also he was my intro to philosophy professor, he used to joke that the word logos, which is for what logic comes from, is in things like biology. And, and so how could someone be a biologist if they don't study logic? How can you know the logical study of life if you don't know logic? And, you know, obviously it was a bit tongue in cheek the way he said that. But I think he had a point there because there are a lot of required classes and it's surprising how many humanities courses are required and within the humanities, logic is not required, which is the kind of bridge between the humanities and STEM, in my opinion. A lot of computer scientists as well as mathematicians take logic as well as humanities folks who are what most of philosophy is about. I think it's the kind of most rigorous area of philosophy especially right this deductive logic and and logic trees which later people people would take that class even to take the LSAT to get into law school even if they didn't want to get a major or minor in philosophy or if they weren't taking a computer science major or if they weren't studying um, physics or mathematics so in general I had this rationalism scholasticism and it is within this environment in which I got closer to God and decided to, return to the Orthodox Church of all places. The Orthodox Church is filled with a lot of mystics. And so I delved into this sort of mysticism that really focuses on over sacramentalization, almost to the point of, you know, seeing things as totally unexplainable, totally magic. And, and there's an element of that, a kernel of that, which is true. Um, we have to take it with a grain of salt, but there's an element of that that is that is true. There are some things that are unexplainable. We take just on faith, which is the utmost trust. But I think people delve into it 
they dive and lean into the mysticism too much. And so I came out of that mainly from the teachings of Father Paul Nadim Tarazi and Father Mark Bulos and Dr. Richard Benton of the Ephesus School Network and of the Orthodox Center for the Advancement of Biblical Studies. But I had the kind of road paved for me by deep biblical teachers in my father confessor, Abba Thomas Finley, in my men one of my mentors in the Bible, um, the teacher Yamana Berhanu, uh, as well as our, our father, Kasis Mabratu, and our beatitude, our bishop, his beatitude, Abu Nabarnavas. These were very formational for me. And of course, uh, at the time he was a deacon, Jonas. Now he became Kasis Jonas. All of these people were kind of great mentors that I had, older men who instructed me in the Bible and kind of led the way for me to take in all of the podcasts of Eugenia Constantinou. And right now I'm reading her book on John's revelation, as well as all of the books, articles, podcasts of the Orthodox center for the advancement of biblical studies, OCABS, as well as the Ephesus school network, which I later joined with my own podcast, Tawahado Bible study, which I repost here, but also can be found at tawahado.transistor.fm. And I forgot to plug it. I need to start plugging it more. Go to patreon.com slash tawahado, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash T-E-W-A-H-I-D-O. I have 10 patrons so far contributing $145 per month. Shout out to all of you. Thank you very much. And I hope to get more to make this more of a full-time venture. So anyway, back to the where I transitioned. I transitioned from this school of rationalism, and I'll explain again what I mean by that, and, and scholasticism into this school of mysticism, and then finally to where I am now, this scriptural school, which focuses more on the parable, on the story or the narrative as a tool of instruction unto life, an instruction to love the invisible God by loving the visible human beings who are the manifestations of his image and of his likeness. And so I love Bishop Robert Barron. But ultimately, there's a, a chasm between the Orthodox Church and the Catholic Church. And this is one of those areas where the chasm grows. You know, I did a review on his Pivotal Players series on St. Benedict. And St. Benedict is, uh, even though he's slightly after our schism, he's close enough to the schism era where I think he's thoroughly Orthodox in his thinking, Every everything I think about him. The kind of closer to the present moment that you get in the in the Catholic Church especially that medieval period is stereotypically referred to as the time where people are debating how many angels can dance on the tip of a needle and other such kind of useless debates. And that that's a, a stereotype. It's a caricature of scholasticism. But the main idea is that you use opaque language, language that people can't see through can't understand that it's not meant for the masses, just for the elites. And it's intentionally so. You use language that intentionally mixes the kind of the logic of Aristotle and the Socratic method of Socrates and of Plato, this kind of guided discussion to allegedly get somewhere that is neutral um, and truth, but really the person who's in charge knows where they're guiding the people the whole time because they're providing the environment. And so there's a bit of two-facedness to it um, that I, I later grew to despise. But I really like Bishop Robert Baer and I really like his engagement with the culture and everything he does. But he he says he's a Thomas. He's, he says he's written a book on on it and and so anyway i'm i'm gonna delve into this but first the technical note so he does this interview a few years ago called thomas aquinas 101 i i i'm sure although I, it doesn't say it explicitly that he used some sort of ai to do a transcript of it he could have paid somebody and then after the fact whether it was an ai or whether it was a human being he edits the transcript and turns it into a 20 page pdf which i was able to read it's nice it's like a long article and it reads conversationally because it is a dialogue. And so there's almost a Socratic method within it. It's like a parable within a parable to relate it to my kind of latest school of thought that I, I feel closest to. And so his pivotal series is, is huge. As I mentioned, I did a review of St. Benedict. He covers people from the ancient times that would be closer to the Orthodox Church, as well as medieval people, as well as people in the 20th century. Surprisingly, I think some of the 20th century folks, because they're critiquing modernity, 
I think I'm closer to those folks than the medieval ones. So I kind of like the most modern folks and uh, who are attacking modernity because uh, I think we have that allegiance there. It's a common allegiance against a common enemy. And then you have the most ancient folks who are almost indistinguishable, if not indistinguishable from the Orthodox Church. So I like that. I'm going to name the people that he's done. He's done Francis of Assisi, right, who's famous for telling people to preach Christianity with their actions, not so much with their words. Thomas Aquinas himself, Kath, uh, Catherine of Siena, John Henry Newman, G.K. Chesterton, I'm going to get back to Chesterton, uh, Michelangelo, Augustine, Benedict, whom I mentioned, Fulton Sheen, Flannery O'Connor. And, you know, honestly, this guy could take all my money. I, I want to watch all the videos. I want to buy all the books. He has himself, uh, Bishop Robert Barron, a commentary on 2 Samuel. That's what I've got my eye on next. And then after that commentary, I plan on looking at these kind of original texts of these thinkers, especially people like G.K. Chesterton and Augustine. Some of the others, you know, I'll probably be more selective about as I have too many books that I own that I haven't read. I've got that Japanese word sundoku, right, where you just pile up so many books and then don't read them. Nassim Taleb calls it the anti-library, and he says it's actually a sign of intelligence so that you're constantly reminded by the books that you have how much you don't know. And it does excite me. It does get me curious to learn. But back to Thomas Aquinas 101. So the technical note being done, the main kind of texts that he has that are survived by him are called the sume. It's a Latin word, right, which means a summary. And so he does these theological summaries, and he acts as what's called a magister, and it's the equivalent of kind of a professor nowadays who has doctoral students under him, and he would have these series of public lectures. And within the public lectures, he would invite all sorts of people from the crowd to play devil's advocate and ask questions that may seem heretical to the church and see what type of defense he would have. So he would have his students answer them kind of immediately, and he would take his time with the most intelligent critiques, according to his point of view, and then his sume are a collection of all of these things. And so it's interesting that towards the end, the interviewer asks Bishop Robert Barron if he is, and I want to quote this, um, that some people consider him to be super rational, an egghead, a philosopher, theologian. And this is supposed to be a critique of the scholasticism and rationalism I mentioned earlier, right? Rationalism as opposed to empiricism. Empiricism being the philosophy that focused more on your experiences and rationalism, which is the epitome of the armchair philosopher, the armchair metaphysician or metaphysicist, the person who tries to you know, solve everything merely by, by thinking. And again, that's kind of the school I came out of in my undergraduate studies, but later it found it distasteful, went to mysticism, found that ultimately not satisfying and have been in this parabolic school, the school of Antioch folk and focusing on that. And its roots also have entered the school of Aksum. So it, it, it aligns with my tradition as well. In any event, Bishop Robert Barron concedes this point and he turns that word super rational of the interviewer and actually says hyper rational. So turns up the notch a little bit and says that, yes, Thomas Aquinas, is hyper-rational. Yes, Thomas Aquinas is Aristotelian. Yes, he's, Platon he's Platonic, and thus, yes, he's Socratic. And he, he says he blends these things in his theology, which for me, the only purpose of studying the Greek language is so that you can understand the New Testament better, but not so that you can get the corpuses of, of the, Gre the corpus of Greek philosophy. Because to me, the corpus of Greek Philosophy is what is being critiqued by the Hebrew Bible and again is picked up by the authors of the New Testament who are very fluent and in fact native speakers of the Hebrew Bible. And so the mixing of Greek philosophy with kind of biblical wisdom is I think the error in general of medieval Catholic philosophy and theology which were wedded together and the epitome of that school is Thomas Aquinas whom I studied in excerpts as an undergraduate and appreciated such things as his argument for the first mover, kind of these basic defenses of God, these apologetics, right? As it says in Peter's epistle, you need an, an apologia, a defense for the hope that is in you. 
And what I'm sad about is that Thomas Aquinas chose to have this defense mixed with Greek philosophy rather than using the Hebraic heart, the Semitic heart that is found in scripture, which again uses narrative and story parables to instruct people always on how to love each other. But Bishop Robert Barron concludes it by saying that while he was these things, admittedly, no debate there, admittedly he is these things, hyper-rationalistic, he is also the man who founded these houses of study that were producing preachers in the Catholic Church. He also has a lot of biblical commentaries that have yet to be translated from Latin to English. So if those of you who know Latin, please translate those biblical commentaries. I'm sure I can be edified by reading them. Even if I don't agree with everything he says in those texts, I'm sure just seeing on how he commented on the Bible and seeing how he produced preachers that should be feeding the kind of souls or the breaths of life of the parishioners, which is a role that Bishop Robert Barron believes Thomas Aquinas embodied. That's why he named his book Spiritual Master. If that is available to me, I would I would love to read that. And it's very interesting. While I am against Thomas Aquinas, even after reading this 20-page PDF, I am curious to see what his biblical commentaries are, less curious to delve into his Aristotelian, Platonic, Socratic theologies and defenses. I think I had enough of that in my undergraduate studies. But I would love to read G.K. Chesterton's poetic introduction. He, he calls it a way of cutting through a lot of the opacity of Thomas Aquinas. So I, I've seen a lot of um, G.K. Chesterton and anything by G.K. Chesterton, I want to read it. So if he's written about Thomas Aquinas, I want to read that. And I would love to read Thomas Aquinas's primary sources, his biblical commentaries. But overall, I'm not interested in the kind of other work surrounding the man. But I appreciate the presentation of Bishop Robert Barron because he's a serious intellectual of the 21st century and he is a resident, a denizen of my beloved city of angels, Los Angeles, which of course got that name from the Catholic Church. Glory to God for all discussions and for all critical thought.